If I could step in and um, we can incorporate those thoughts into our next session centered around the concept of uh, crisis or chaos and community or crisis and change. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. I'd like to start off by reintroducing myself. My name is Carl Wolf. Um, I live in Hammond, Indiana in Northwest Indiana and I'm a member of First Unitarian of Hobart, Indiana, um, a uh, congregation that's been in operation, I think, since I think uh, the 1870s. Uh, they've been there in Hobart, uh, in the same building, um, and so it's pretty neat. Um, I came to Unitarianism uh, oh, probably about eight years ago. Uh, I'm a lifelong activist. I'm a lifelong um, resident of Northwest Indiana. Um, growing up, I was not a member of any particular religion. My family was, I'm, I'm an atheist. I grew up an atheist. Uh, but as, uh, as I got older, I was looking for a place to call home um, in terms of my um, social justice work in a place really to uh, um, come into community. And more than anything, um, the Unitarian Church in Hobart has brought that for me. I've made a lot of friends there over the last eight to 10 years, people I love dearly. Um, it's been a, a great experience for me and my wife who uh, grew up Greek Orthodox um, and, our, and our children. So we, so we brought, so, you know, I, I, so my motivation was to bring a home for my social justice work. Um, and the Unitarian Church obviously was, was a, 
right right for that it's, it's part it's part of the deal with uh, unitarianism so um, I I am a uh, the executive director of a nonprofit organization in the south suburbs of Chicago, um, where we provide basic services for people in need. And so uh, obviously the last month has been a time of, of great, um, great chaos <laughs> um, for our organization. I'll get back to, I'll get back to, get back to that in a minute. Um, one of, the, one of the reasons why I joined UMIAC um, was um, as I've been involved, um, my, my, my notions and my, my ideas around the fights against racism um, is, is one uh, based on a material class analysis, um, one that, that determines that uh, that racism is 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 a harmful harmful uh, evil evil way of being and that um, it it oppresses uh, our, our black and Hispanic brothers and sisters but that it also damages uh, the white community as well and that it is in all of our interests um, both out of, of brotherhood and, and love for one another, but also out of our own self-preservation um, that, that we fight racism. Um, canary in the coal mine, the ability for the, uh, you know, to use Marxist language, the ability of the ruling class to, to further oppress the working class. Um, and so as a, uh, as someone who who approaches the fight against racism in that in that with that mind frame, Umiak um, was you know was was a perfect fit for me. Um, one that that allows somebody like myself to not to 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 be in the leadership against racism to 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 hope that I would help to take the leadership, but also to be in in brotherhood and struggle with with uh, with all races in that fight. I, I knew Finley as a youth because he and my parents were, uh, were in the anti-racist struggle together back in the uh, 70s. But it gives me a, a special um, relationship with Finley where I can call him out on his bull faster than uh, some other people might. <laughs> but he does the same to me. <laughs> Going back to the work that I do as director of a nonprofit, you know, and this notion of crisis and change, you know, over the last two weeks as a, as an agency serving the poor and the homeless and the hungry, homeless. our agency, uh, it's called Respond Now. So as the executive director of this nonprofit um, and doing the work that we do, we've been presented with a lot of opportunities over the last um, two weeks. We've had a lot of resources and funding thrown our way um, for for food, um, to put people in motel, put the homeless in motel rooms, um, to, uh, to do additional work. And so this is, uh, in the midst of this crisis, um, this is an opportunity, unfor you know, unfortunately, um, for my agency to do this important work. And um, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm certain that the agency that I run is not even prepared to handle the level of resources that we've been given. We don't have the staffing capacity um, to, to, to uh, dish out these resources in a way that, um, that would be most helpful. But we're doing what we can given our limits, but it, it shows um, that within this chaos of the coronavirus, there is a response, um, you know, of community. We've been getting more individual donations. We've been getting resources from the state, resources from the county government. Um, what's unfortunate and, and what, what we have to be aware of is um, this, this, this uh, chaos and this crisis has turned into this community, but what is it going to ultimately evolve into once this once this time has passed, are we going to say, well, 
shit, you know, uh, there were this, you had these uh, resources and funds this whole time to give us sufficient dollars to be providing housing and, and resources to the community. And only when there's a crisis, it was always a crisis of some level or another, but you know, then the, the extreme crisis hit. And so what's the synergy that's gonna come out of that? Are we going to be able to turn this opportunity into a long-term hopeful solution to, to, um, to answer the needs of our brothers and sisters who are impoverished? And so I would ask this group of people here, all uh, 31 of us right now anyway, to think about, to think about that, to think about the current um, crisis within the, the UUA in those terms. What is the crisis going on in your particular congregation? What is the, what is the debate? What is the struggle? Some of us have endured attacks more than others, uh, but, but yet even with, in all of our congregations, um, even if it's not around the gadfly papers, maybe it's around the question of, of racism, maybe it's around a totally different question, but there's always a tension, there's always a crisis that can turn into something else and an opportunity. And so I would like to, to, to pose those two phenomena uh, to, to, all, to each of you um, to, to talk about how these times of, of trouble um, within your congregation or community, uh, you know, if you want to talk about the coronavirus in that aspect, let's do it. Or if you want to talk about people's response to um, our current occupier of the White House, then let's do it. What are the opportunities that are coming out of these times that we are in? So if you want to describe the crisis, describe maybe the opportunity. Actually, I want something to destruct this. What's going on in your church? You've been, you were <laughs> one of the few people who are well, describing. First of all, I'll just say very briefly, I had some of the same kinds of problems in the um, church that I was in in Culpeper, but more recently, uh, the minister of our church was one of the signers of the letter condemning Todd Eckloff. And I had, um, I asked her whether she'd read the book and she said no, uh, which, you know, we've heard a lot of, um, and I find very interesting. Um, Within our own church, I've talked to a few people, and there are some, including a member of the board and a former president who, um, I, I need to talk to some more, I never really have followed up on that enough, but who's you know, very much concerned in the same way that all of us are, um, there are, other people who are going along with the with the current leadership, and I have to say that the most vocal people are the ones who agree with the the current minister. And there's this sense, and I've experienced it myself a couple of times, that if you speak up um, and you don't completely agree with the way things are going now you're viewed as a problem. So it's, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to overcome. It's, they've, they've managed to, by a few, I think it may be mostly a few people, although I think a lot of others just really don't care, but it may be mostly a few people that have kind of taken over the conversation by making it um, at least socially dangerous to disagree with them. So and so you've seen you've seen evidence of that in your congregation. Yes, yes, I've experienced it. And how did how, how did what did that look like? I don't know what to add to what I've just said. It's it's a you know a few vocal people have um, towed what is now the dominant I would say party line in UUA. I, and it's not necessarily a majority of people either in, in my congregation or in UUA, but they're the ones who have kind of taken over the conversation by intimidating other people. One of the issues that I think I would like to hear people talk about is 
has you been, are you losing membership issue or for any other issues that makes you concerned? Are, are your churches growing or not growing during this period of time of, of chaos? I'd like to have that as a part of the response from people, particularly from people who are dealing with the uh, situation. And if, if I could, uh, if I could tag Jonathan tweet Seattle, have yeah. him expound on his, his beginning uh, comments there in the chat box. I married a, a black woman. She died several years ago, but um, we joined a Unitarian church and raised our biracial daughter there here in Seattle. And, um, and in the last couple of years, my daughter has dropped out. She was, she's moved to Pasadena now, but she um, was attending the local, uh, a local church with her boyfriend. And, um, uh, but you know, her mom did not have sort of the critical race theory view of race and, um, and neither does she and neither do I. And so she doesn't like conflict and she's just dropped out. Um, theoretically she could come back if we get to a point where the people who disagree are not treated like fools or racists or, you know, roadblocks. So I've been trying to get a dialogue going in my congregation for a couple of years. And, I, uh, and I've just sort of been, di you know, diverted and deflected and uh, told one thing and then offered another. And, and so I guess my next step is I'm going to go to the board. And I have learned that you have to be super positive when you uh, raise these issues. Because I think other people have said here today, if you, if you voice a concern about the narrative that's being taught, the people who support the narrative will tell everyone that you're a racist, or, or, you know, or you have got white privilege, or you're being defensive. So my approach is to aim towards reconciliation and healing. And so what I want to do is go to the board and say, what can we do in our congregation to start the reconciliation over these conflicts that are dividing our community both within our congregation and the, the whole the whole thing so I, I know my daughter has dropped out i just heard today from uh, a woman in another local congregation who dropped out because people were ragging on her son who is um raising issues and so i've talked with lots of uus who say you know they're not contributing as much to the uua or they don't they want to keep their heads down and not have anything to do with the UUA because they don't support its direction and don't see any way to change it. So if you listen to some of the people who are proposing, you know, the narrative, the white supremacy narrative, they kind of do want people to leave if they don't get on board. And I do see people leaving who are not getting on board. And that seems like their plan is working. They are successfully driving people away. When when we first started the white supremacy teach-in um, at my congregation, one of the social justice leaders said to me, um, you know, if we do this right, it means that people will leave. And if we are not doing it correctly, uh, if, if people aren't leaving over it, that means we're not pushing hard enough. So they, you know, it's, it's not, it is sort of, their program is going as planned when people like my daughter drop out. So can you, can you describe that? What is that, a white supremacy teaching? Yeah, that was the thing from 2017. After, after Aisha Hauser and, you know, the, the crew on social media sort of mobbed Morales and drove him out of office, then they um, pivoted really fast and did that white supremacy teaching, like the end of April, beginning of May in 2017. So that's when things, up until the social media firestorm around Morales. My daughter and I knew that the people in charge at the UUA had these sort of precious ideas about racism and, you know, kind of obviously sort of trading in white guilt and stuff. And we thought that was kind of harmless and almost endearing, right? But, um, <laughs> but it, it didn't hurt us any. It didn't, you know, we were just doing our thing. And then with Morales, suddenly that those that group decided it was time to turn up the heat now and just just in those last three years that the pressure has gotten really hard and that's why that's why my daughter's dropped out just these last couple of years after being a lifelong 
you you do you see any opportunities coming out of this so uh as you know part of the pandemic i'm doing more stuff online i was not going to attend this convocation I, you know i'm in seattle um so it because we're in the pandemic this went online and that means now i can uh participate and in the same way um i sort of I'm in contact with a couple other dissenters at local congregations. There's several congregations in the Seattle area and all of them that I have any insight into have conflicts over their race narrative. Um, so I'm in contact with a couple of people at a couple other congregations and we've been able to get together online and I've introduced them to each other. And so I do feel like I'm making some connections that I otherwise uh, wouldn't be making, but it's also, right, it's not a great time to try to get a message out to people. My concern is that people who present the narrative have things so polarized that um, any sort of discussion involves conflict and people don't, don't like conflict. And a lot of people like my daughter would rather drop out of church than face conflict. So then the question is how do we honor our liberal principles um, without it being the kind of fight that just makes people leave. Yeah, I would um, say a little bit about my congregation. It's very small, um, probably, you know, 40 people, if you count everybody that, 45, everybody who ever comes. Um, so probably only about 22 signed members. But, um, and someone was just saying, you know, we need to educate our our membership and get this into the congregations, but I've just been real hesitant to even bring this whole issue to my congregation because it's sort of like they are, they're not involved in this issue. They don't have a problem with people of color. We have speakers of all different colors and, and a few members of, of um, darker skin folks, but, um, I, sometimes I just don't want to bring it up because I'm afraid they'll say, well, the UUA is stupid and I don't want them to drop out of the church because the UUA is doing this ridiculous thing. And so we didn't, I have not done any of those sessions that uh, we've been asked to do to, or, or congregants to um, examine their racial biases and so forth. Um, I. I just didn't think that that was going to be helpful in our small church. We're just all very, uh, very much a supportive community. And I didn't see any point to be bringing up something to, to controversial that we weren't needing to deal with. And yet Beverly, uh, it must have been what, eight months ago now or so that Finley and I and a couple of others um, came down to Kokomo to talk about this, you know, essentially this exact topic. Um, right. So what was what was the the reaction to that? I you know post uh, after we had left or even while we were there, if you help me remember. <laughs> yeah, I, we had a nice group that uh, met with you, and like I said, you were warmly welcomed, and um, I think they believe that that. Um, there is no place for racism in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and they don't see that as a problem in our congregation. Um, and so they were interested in hearing the information about uh, UMIAC. And like I said, three other people joined UMIAC as a result of that meeting. Um, because they believe in uh, uh, supporting people wherever they are that are maybe being treated or mistreated. But um, I'm just saying, I, I have not, I've, I've talked some about it and I did invite Finley to come talk to us, but he didn't dwell on um, I mean, he dealt with issues that are, um, you know, ongoing for generations in our country about uh, the racial situation.
but I haven't, um, I haven't done much work that the UUA has encouraged us to do in terms of people analyzing themselves and so forth because I just thought it wouldn't be helpful in our situation. Yes, Dr. Michael Johnson, you have your hand raised. Dr. Uh, thanks for my work life. So, Hi, Michael. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm curious about several things. Does anyone have experience making progress in their churches with the sort of approach that Jonathan was just describing? Because we certainly have, you know, I have just been baffled, you know, frankly, our experience, this is from Wildflower in Austin, is that anything that we say is construed as evidence of right agility or racism or defensiveness or resistance. And, and I, don't, I don't have a sense that anybody in leadership or in the core of kind of uh, white supremacy culture, true believers in our church, uh, that we're taken seriously, that there's any interest in rapprochement, frankly. Uh, in line with what you were saying, Jonathan, I, we too have heard from the pulpit and from leadership that some people will just have to leave. Um, and so I, you know, I feel like I just run into a wall and, and I know I'm asking for the Holy Grail here, but you know, if, if anybody has any magic voodoo that they think is useful in, in opening other people's minds and inviting them into conversation, I'd certainly like to hear about it. Uh, Paul, you, you had your hand raised. I did. I've been, you know, as I mentioned before, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. I, I know people who are interested. Without being reductionist, we can divide UUs into three kinds of people. Those who are firmly in favor of the uh, dismantle white supremacy uh, um, approach. Those who find it to be problematic, many of whom are here on this call. And the vast majority in the middle who really don't want to be bothered by this. But, you know, here, so here's my question. Um, how do we reach congregations? We do not have the means of communication. Uh, the means of communication are held by the UAC. Um, how do we find those persons within congregations who are concerned about this creeping Calvinism that we find within do you is Finley, go ahead. I think you put your finger on it. Uh, in a uh, in my reading of the Reformation, I saw the rise of these clusters, variety of clusters of uh, Lutherans, Calvinists, Anabaptists, all the rest, uh, who uh, either were expelled from or became so disillusioned with the uh, Catholic hierarchy structure, they, they literally started to recreate smaller units based on principle. Of course, having some kind of sense of, and I'll use my language and you come with your own, divine or being part of something bigger beyond mere, mere visible matter. Uh, I call it dialectical materialism when I'm feeling philosophical and I, I'm feeling Christian, I call it historical theism. That helps a lot to have a, a, a vision that we are part of a imperative to put people together. As the cells of the body over billions of years figured out they had to come together, Bobby will hate what I just said, uh, figured it out. But as they came together so that now we are of one body physically in our own nature, I would argue that, the, that Paul's vision of the church as an organic reality of all the parts working together is really the picture of the human race. Once we get past the iron chain of necessity, as Marx calls it, where we are now trapped in unfreedom and un, in, under the power of necessity, it is we got to make a living and move into the arena of freedom, where finally true individuality, true community, all acting at the same time will emerge. Therefore, if you are in environments where you, you, you feel yourself isolated, you must heighten the contradiction. They must either, you would no longer, your daughter, I understand why she had to do it, but what she should have done, and when you want to do it, I, <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm doing it. We must raise these issues right there and call for these congregational meetings where they say, finally get tired of you and say, on the basis of your constantly raising this question of unity and, and dissent and the seven principles, you are hereby expelled. Then you take a deep breath. 
now we can build a real Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. We must recreate congregational polity from the ground up, where two or three are gathered together in the name of these seven principles. There is the UUAC also. Brian, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add that in our fellowship, a lot of these same things are, are happening. We've had you know, several sermons about how whites are all guilty of original sin and the, the same thing about any response to that is just offensive and shows that you really don't get it to the point that um, one congregant during the joys and, and problems um, said that he wanted to confess that uh, every, not a day went by that he wasn't ashamed of the fact that he was a white heterosexual male and he, he grieved at that. The only thing he could do to make up for it was to try to be as decent as he could. At the same time, the local NAACP chapter here is doing, I think, some very useful work. Everybody else seemed to be shocked they would uh, attack reason or thinking because among other things, they've been doing work with immigrants and they had a, a uh, black musician in residence, which brought them at least one or more people who were Hispanic and other things into the country. It's not very much, but it's a very small place. And then in another case, um, I listened to one of the cluster meetings to a uh, minister who went on and about telling about how uh, awful the white gaze was and on and on and on and everybody listened politely and then they went away and then somebody said to me I think we've got a problem and so we started talking about what you know where did this come from what is it and I've been distributing Todd's book among other things uh, but they didn't want, and then later on, there was another meeting in which everybody got into full civil rights mode with uh, with spirituals and hooray, we're all going to be not damned, but we're all going to be, we're all going to uh, change the world together. Now, what, that's one of the things that bothers me. None of these people seem to want to do anything concrete except read out other people. Finally, I did a service in another place, which was about uh, the person who uh, had called me out. I said, you called the wrong guy out. I have remote cousins who are Native Americans. I'm painfully aware of the situation. And so I did a Thanksgiving service about talking about the problems of Native Americans since the beginning and the problem about my being related to both sides of this conundrum. And it was it seemed to be fairly well received, but nobody seemed to want to buy into this very large thing, which I don't know if these people are representative at all. I just can't figure out. I, it doesn't seem like most people actually are particularly enthusiastic about it. Now, maybe they are other places, and I must admit, I'm in a place so remote that uh, the COVID virus hasn't gotten too much here. But, uh, you know, and I remember, and I would say one thing that I thought that was constructive. One of the things I found most constructive in previous ministries, I tried to organize tours of the Chicago Children's Choir. I don't know what our status is relating to the Children's Choir, but I'm sure. Uh, and I remember our singer uh, from the time I worked at First Unitarian at the desk. But I'm one, uh, as far as getting anywhere, I wonder because there's no better, there was no better uh, image of what I'd like to see as a bunch of people singing together, a bunch of kids singing together who came to stay in your house and who uh, were all of every kind of color and uh, mode of being that you'd like, uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, telling how awful everything is. It seemed to me to be a picture of 
what I wanted to see. Of course, I don't know. I know either the Chicago Children's Choir now is completely separate from First Unitarian, as I understand it. But I, I just think that that's a vision of what we want. And I talk too much. It's, a, it's an occupational hazard. <laughs> I did want to um, reiterate I Finley's point about raising the contradiction and taking those risks and um, you know, putting ourselves in quote unquote, I guess danger, danger, whatever you want to call it, um, in in this struggle. Um, you know, I, the ex one example I can give, particularly around um, the Gadfly papers, is that I, as I started, as as we were starting to talk about it within the congregation, and I went to our uh, minister, who is, um, but he's a consulting minister. He'll, he's only there for the year. I said, oh, you know, this is this is really this thing is really blowing up. You know, we should have a conversation about it. And his reaction was, we do not want to have a conversation about that. The congregation can't handle it. We've got too many other things going on right now, and nobody should read that book. <laughs> like, wow, I, you are totally the stereotype that everybody's been <laughs> talking about. But uh, unfortunately, if that was two months ago, I have not, I'm not, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm scared. I don't know, or whatever it may be. I have not heightened that contradiction and told him essentially to go, you know, go shove it somewhere and we're going to have this conversation anyway. Um, and so, you know, that would be an example of that would be heightening the contradiction. And so I would, I, I welcome. Um, additional thoughts, I think, in, in how you can um, heighten that contradiction. Again, not just simply around the Gaffly papers and the studying of it, but uh, amongst our other work that we're, that we're doing at our... Go ahead, uh, Jay. Carl, so if I, I'd like to comment on what Paul said about the three types of people, because I agree, there are those who are fully engaged, fully opposed, and then not interested. I refer to those as loosely affiliated which I used to think was a temporary state, either you get engaged or not engaged. But to me, I'm beginning to believe that's a permanent state for many members and congregations. So the question is, how do you reach those? Um, and uh, Finley had mentioned about having that conversation. So um, not long after the controversy of 2019, uh, Todd, of your situation, I was actually learning about that while I was on the in Nova Scotia, in the backwoods of Nova Scotia, with imperfect cell phone coverage, slowly reading bits and pieces of the controversy unfolding. So uh, after finally absorbing all that, I put together a presentation about my experience learning about the controversy at GA. Not the contents, but the controversy. Just let people know what happened on it. Fortunately, we have a tradition at my congregation called Second Hour, where that was possible to have a conversation. And it, it packed the house, and including members from other congregations in the Atlanta area. It was simply retelling, and I had learned a lot about this from um, Scott Wells, who I think many of you know, who I, was a true advisor to me and other things. And so I followed this, explained it, and people said, I didn't know that happened. And it's still true today. But continuing that conversation, I've had other quote second hours that have been rescheduled and rescheduled. And so having the ability, Finley, to have the floor, to have the congregational meeting, to actually engage people in an open, non-prescriptive conversation is really uh, being muted, at least in my congregation, which has actually taken a different path, a little more darkened, is that they're, they're adopting policies that are odious in my book. and and frightening. Um, even having a member expelled for an opinion. So uh, having the conversation is hard to have in the environment when you can't get the floor and can't get to the microphone. What was the uh, explanation of what, what were they expelled for? I, I don't want to reveal too much because after that happened, we had a very extraordinary event that we actually called a congregational-led meeting that was only the second time that's occurred in the 50 year history of the church uh, to have this conversation. So if, if I'm a little vague, I'll, I'll study that way because my congregation hasn't discussed it yet, but it had to do with the Gadfly papers. 
So, uh, which is a toxic, as I mentioned to you earlier, Todd, is an automatic bit of radiate, radioactivity that people respond to very negatively. And, and, but, and, so, and so, Jay, where do you go from there? I mean, what, what, what's the, the organizing going on between, between those, you know, <coughs> to present at this, I guess, congregational meeting in a, in a collective, cohesive way? So the bylaws allow for this congregational meeting to be called, which was done. Um, based on a number of signatures. And then the coronavirus struck. And so we opted not to have that meeting until after we resume face-to-face -face meetings at our congregation. So it's a bit in hiatus. But in the interim, the board um, passed a set of policies that are really breathtaking in their scope. In fact, my conversation with you right now could be construed as being out of covenant. I'm serious, I'm serious. Good. And um, that policy granted the board that supersedes anything in our bylaws about membership. That's how someone got expelled. There we go. So uh, this is more than just an academic discussion. This is someone, a, a member, who, a person who'd been at UU for 50 years is told, don't come back. Don't come on campus. The covenant's turning into a dangerous word. It, it, it's, um, it's frightening. So I'm choosing my words carefully. Um, and this is having a ricocheting effect in, in chilling people's willingness to have a conversation. I'll just say one more thing, what happened? We had a visit from some UUA staff member who talked about covenant to our congregation. And the word, you know, treating people kindly, assuming the best intention was pushed back and say, no, you're responsible for any impact. You're responsible, you're accountable. And the word accountable was said so hard, so harshly one member, I'm sure not realizing it, said out loud, I'm afraid. And that resulted in a off-site congregational meeting at some third party location, rental space, so, so people could actually decompress from that visit. There, there's, there's fear in, the, in, in my congregation, fear. I, I don't know how to express it any less harsh. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And we're, con and we're concerned because all of us are committed to our congregation, but being committed doesn't mean we want to stay on this path and we don't know how to discuss the path. We don't know how to get a, have a collective conversation of which way the rudder is being pointed. And to Finley's point, that's the core problem. It's hard to get that conversation started. So when I'm excommunicated, I'll send out an email to all you guys. <laughs> I just like, people were talking about three categories. I think there are multiple categories. I think the I think my views are probably really different than a lot of your views on, you know, what's going on in our congregation around race. I you know, I've I've been in churches where racial views um by and actions by white uh, white members were very problematic. Um but I don't think that shaming, blaming ejecting is is the way to handle it i, th I think i think the uh, the real difference is uh you know how do you handle differences even really serious differences or things that maybe most of us would agree were problematic and is it in this negative anti-unitarian way or is it in a in a unitarian way i i've taught i taught a class in prisons and I was asked to come and do a UU class in a prison. Now uh, it was a it was a UU curriculum where people were, you know, free to express their opinions and rob banks and all kinds of things. And you know, I was, I was a little hesitant. I thought, well gee, I you know, <laughs> this this might not be a place where Unitarian Universalist values work, you know, and where uh, people obviously have uh, think it's okay to rob banks, et cetera, et cetera. I couldn't have been more wrong. It's best, best class, I, I mean, that sort of atmosphere in which people are free to uh, talk, they much more open than any group I've ever had. Any, anyone who knows prisons knows that they're not usually that way. It's, a, it, <laughs> it, it, it's just, do we tr trust our humanistic values 
as to how we interact with each other? Or do we think, oh, we have to be authoritarian um, in order to, and just reject all our, our values, um, you know, on behalf of this ideology? And uh, I think... So, you know, I think I'm, I'm probably the opposite from Paul on a lot of views, um, but, but that doesn't mean that I, uh, I would, uh, rec you know, kick him out of the church because he doesn't agree with me. We can agree to disagree in a respectful way. I, my opinion, I, I don't believe that my opinion is required by everybody. You can have a different opinion. Yeah. Than mine. There's one other since uh, we're talking about types, I've witnessed on Facebook a number of times, but also much more in my congregation, raising these issues, uh, even in as diplomatic a way as you think is required in order to get them on the agenda, is uh, itself regarded as a derogation of faith in our leadership. Um, that is closely related to those who don't want to be bothered at all, uh, but not quite. Uh, and I, I find that to be um, a, a real issue, and uh, it is often thrown, thrown up when someone like myself raises issues that are critical of the UUA or critical of uh, uh, board leadership. Well, did you get my point, though? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay. Looking down the road, we have uh, the GA 2020 coming up. The, the, the joys and concerns of our congregations are now a major part of how we view our work. Many of us are very committed to the congregational reality that we have. So it's not going to be an easy thing to, quote, walk away. That's why I don't encourage any walking away. But we do need to open up a discussion uh, with the center uh, in uh, Marxist Leninist thought there are three divisions, which we've all called there's the, the right wing, hardcore, ideologically committed, only God can change their minds, or uh, to use uh, the, Mary, the Marie Antoinette analogy, the guillotine. Then there are those in the center, waver this way, waver that way, uh, good, I, good people with bad ideas, bad people with good ideas, they, and then there are those of us who are on the left. Well, in our case, if those of us who agree that these principles and the history we have bought into the whole nine yards, we embrace the history. We are proud of the history. We are astonished by the history. It is amazing what that history is. Passion and reason, pagan-centered and Christian, Jewish, and non-Jewish. I want to add Islam one of these days to our, our sources. Connections we have made over coffee and birthdays and dinners and potlucks. So there's this rich history that makes us Unitarian Universalism bound together, not by a creed, but by principles. But if those principles are not acting in a binding way, then we have the problem. I think in our efforts not to be creedal, I remember seeing these t-shirts, nothing but deeds, no creed. Well, that sounded good when it was first said, but uh, there's a word for it called pragmatism and pragmatism without grace or love or virtue can turn into its opposite, that there is nothing there to stand up when it's not practical or safe to do these good deeds. So it was mentioned earlier that we need to revitalize our theological understanding of what it is to be a Unitarian Universalist. And we begin with those people in this room. So I recommend that we begin to read more in James Luther Adams' book, The Prophethood of All Believers. I mean, that's a good beginning to establish the grounding of what we're talking about as the crisis or the chaos increases. At First Unitarian Church, we built a base by being the ones who do things in a positive way. We're the ones that are concerned about the lack of a caring committee. We're the ones that are concerned about the fact there is no worship and music committee. We're the ones that can, uh, people call you up and put together an emergency contact team when the Kairos virus first hit, all the ministers could think of do was shut down the church. What we did, the MAC members and friends, was put together clusters of people to take 
and they began to respond to the practical works we we're talking about. So one of the leaders of the centrists just joined UBIAC the other day. He said, like, you're the guys that's doing something. Secondly, we came up with alternative ways of doing the same thing. So they wouldn't let me teach my class. So uh, we put together something called Conversations About Racism. I wouldn't allow to leave the word against racism. And we've been having a series of conversations where we get people to share their experiences about dealing with racial issues, sexual relationships, personal relationships. We're getting ready to do one this uh, Sunday on the, on the battle against World War II, where our fathers and mothers and some of our people in this room remember fighting against real white supremacy, the Nazi fascist forces, and also the civil rights struggle, where we actually defeated white supremacy. So we have, we, we have now created a second church. It, it, it has one group talks about world politics, world history, doing a book called How to Hide an Empire. Eight, nine, 10, 15, 20 people sometimes sit in this room and sometimes we discuss issues of, of the rest of the church. And sometimes we get attacked, which we were big time uh, last year by an enemy of, uh, of the other side. So we gotta be creative about this issue. If they decide to expel us from the church at first you, it'll be like tearing out lots of good people who've been there for years. And some of these people have paid a lot of money into the church and are still paying a lot of money into the church because we built these friendships. I don't know what it can be done in your smaller congregations or bigger congregations, but here's the three principles that I've come up with real quick. Number one, Build Mac nucleus and chapters in your area. Let the, let the Unitarian Universalist Multiracial Unity Action Council be the potential for an alternative view if you get thrown out of your church or if there's a, you can't stand it anymore. Number two, do work of reality in your churches so that you're the ones that are sort of the, carrying the water. You can be dependent on at the potlucks and the coffee so that any attempt to kind of drive you out of the church will lead to a lot of response by people who agree you have a right to your opinions. And last but not least, start reaching out to the community. One of the visions I have, uh, uh, Sister Beverly knows about it, turns out there was a, a strike of the UAW in Kokomo, there's a big factory down there. And I said, well, look, why don't you just go over there and see what they're doing. She went over, blew her horn in support, and they waved at her in support. So I think we're gonna have to sort seeing the community at large, particularly our white wake workers, the white working class people who are being excluded from a lot of this discourse or blamed for everything. I think by moving it out into the community with these ideas, with the seven principles, with this vision of multiracial, multicultural, international solidarity, I think we can sort of begin to look like the Christians had to do when they left the synagogues or the Protestants had to do when they were expelled from the cathedrals. We begin to turn to that community, but then it's where our work is really supposed to be. That is where our work is really supposed to be. That is where our work is supposed to be. I see. I see your hand is raised, but I want to. I want to raise that point that through this time, you know, the 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 accusations of, you know, being white supremacists or being uh, being racist ourselves for for pushing back against the way the UUA is doing the work. Um, <laughs> I think there's no better antidote than that than 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 being involved in the struggle against racism and saying you can't you know you can't say that about me or that person or you can't say that about Finley or Bobby they've been engaged in the anti-racist struggle Finley took bullets from the Klan Bobby Bobby has been involved and in, I only pick on those two because I know them Bobby has been involved in the anti-racist struggle since the since uh, what Minneapolis or since the '60s, and so I think that that showing you know bringing showing them like you can't you can't make that accusation. I'm out there on the front lines fight against racism in, in a real way. You know, I mean, it is important that we do this work internally that we push back against the politics or the the, the structure internally of the UUA and that we bring it within. Our congregations and have these discussions but at the, at the end of the day you know the proof is in the pudding and, and our feet our feet are the proof and, and if we're out there you know fighting for for our brothers and sisters I don't you know they can't they can't tell us nothing Paul Finley's thought is is, is a really good one uh, so I'm gonna join us uh, right after this is uh, done 
uh, and I'm going to look at starting a chapter here. But you know, okay, so let's get back to my uh, to my reductionist notion of the three categories: those who are committed to the uh, uh, Eremoic um, view, those who those like us who are opposed, and the vast numbers in the middle. The vast numbers in the middle, I'm uh, interested in, but I'm not as worried about. I'm not as but I would like to find out how do we reach those in congregations who are like us. Um, it is very difficult to find a way of doing that. And I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts. I would say, I would say scream it from the pulpit. Well, there's a lot of pulpits to scream from, to sh tell them they are not alone that they are, their concerns are reflected by others. Your question about reaching the, what I call the loosely affiliated or the middle? No, about those who are concerned, those like us who feel that this is a false path. We've tried a number of different ways, like I said, at our conversation, in our congregation with these second era conversations, even offsite. It turns out that people are hungering for some information and clarity. And so some way of passing information to folks, either through email or web post or Facebook, we've been reaching, but I'll share just one more time. This new policy adopted by our board actually makes that type of communication um, open to review of being, quote, out of covenant. I, I, I don't want to be too alarmist, but there is a cold wind coming down on conversation. And this is a direct UUA sponsored policy too. So again, I need to be vague because my congregation doesn't know about it. We haven't discussed it yet, but this is a threatening way of shutting down normal conversation as well. So there's a second front that needs to be considered. Go ahead, Alan. Okay, um, I think you need to try to raise these kind of issues in all kinds of various formats. I mean, some, in some cases it's, book discussion groups. In other cases, like you'll have a denominational affairs committee. Other times it's various church forums. So there's a variety of avenues that most churches have one way or another and trying to get, whether it's yourself or a group of people together to organize an event that raises a discussion, whether it's through a discussion of the, of the book like Gadfly Papers or just, you know, the fifth principle project or whatever it may be, Discussing these things in a, in, a, in a forum that brings in more people into the discussion is a way to build a nucleus and build from that point. So I think that there's usually some avenue in most congregations to try to, you know, uh, encourage uh, discussion and, uh, you know, critical thinking on these issues. So that's the way I would suggest people try to do. I'll leave it at that. When we were trying to get signatures for our letters, there were just, I think, four or five of us. And uh, we, we had kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, contacts, either verbally or, um, you know, through email with people we knew who we thought might be sympathetic to our point of view. And sometimes we were way wrong, and, but a lot of times we were really right. And, and um, people, even uh, so we got the signatures really by reaking out what one on one with people we knew uh, talking to them chatting with them whatever um, and uh, you know, you know, that kind of a pushback but you know a lot of us got uh, labeled um, but then we got also a lot of names of sort of site what you might call uh, silent supporters, people who I think they would vote with us if we had a, a um, you know, if there was a vote, if there, you know, if you didn't have to put your name be out before uh, everybody, uh, but if they would be in support in some way and they were, got, they're kind of, you know, they're just afraid. They're just afraid. So, but at least we have those names. We knew, know who those people are. Um, so, but I think, you know, that most of us, even I mean, ministers certainly, but a lot of the lay people I know, we have a, a network beyond our, our church and within our church. And uh, that's often a way you can do it 
uh, in or in terms of organizing and in terms of finding out who's who's uh, amenable to at least thinking about these issues. I think that the issue of this chaos community crisis challenge is fundamentally the fault line throughout a lot of those people who are concerned Unitarian Universalists. And I think I agree with the formulation that Brother uh, Thompson, uh, Thompson brought up about the, the ones who are, see themselves as Unitarian Universalists. However they see it, some through long time participation through their families, some through the earlier liberal days of the LLR, whatever those initials meant, some by recent converts who are so desirous of both a church where there's rationality and spiritual practices that are familiar with hymns, singing, organs playing, or just having a wonderful uh, communion service around coffee. Uh, there's a guy at the University of Chicago whose name I probably will mangle, uh, who, uh, who argues that the unique nature of Unitarian Universalism is the creedless church. The people who don't want to sit home on Sunday drinking a cup of coffee, reading the New York Times, and watching C-SPAN. On the one hand, that's my modern version of it. But nor do they want to be in those kind of things where they're locked into a crazy language which no longer means anything to them, such as Jesus turning water into wine. The argument he made, Martin Marty, that was his name, Martin Marty, giving a defense of Unitarian Universalism because he was friends of some sort with Brother Morales. He said, we need that type of church. We do not need a world of nuns, my language. People don't know, have no faith tradition whatsoever, who then depend on us and our morality and our virtue to maintain the society like we're doing it right now when those folks, a lot of them Christians, go to work with, the, with, with or without masks. Some ethical energy is driving them to risk their lives for, quote, strangers, almost a, a Christian metaphor of picking up that cross and doing the work. We are the custodians of this valuable phenomenon called Unitarian Universalism. And I had the universalism to it and would not let our divorce take place, Todd. We are the custodians. Being the custodian of something like this with this great history, Civil War. I mean, everybody should get a book, a movie or something uh, we were involved in the Civil War, the abolitionist movement, the suffrage movement. When we were in uh, Transylvania, we were fighting on side by side with the, uh, the Islamic forces against the Catholic reaction. It is quite an incredible history that it energizes me to even think about it. Therefore, here is what I'm going to suggest. In these fights, let's, let's have two fights at the same time as was presented by Carl. We will continue the battle for the right of free speech, the right of dissent. That's going to be our main battle. But we want to have a target. And I believe that the target should be what King died for, the poor people's campaign. The question of poverty, of economic inequality, which is Dick Burkhardt's great mantra. White, black, brown, red, yellow, poor folks coming together. And my particular spin on it, is to show how the average white worker since 1969 has been a victim of the anti-black racism that we thought was only directed to brown and black people. So I'm now adding a third category, black, brown, and white folks who are poor in Kokomo, poor in Austin, wherever these poor folks are, they become that what we want to begin to move our conversations about and carry out that battle. So we have this contradiction of doing two things at once. One, raising the issue of a movement that already exists, but planning to do some kind of March in September, which I don't know any more about, but some gentleman from North Carolina is behind it. Uh, he's a minister and he calls it the third reconstruction. We should adopt the third reconstruction model. We need to hook up with the trade union movement. Therefore, we need to see anytime there's a strike or some kind of working class action. And a lot of them are merging now because of the way they are being mistreated and all these layoffs that are coming up. We begin to think about creating uh, multiracial trade union support groups in our churches. Action, action, action. And thirdly, and most importantly, we begin to set up our own 
freedom schools, our own freedom schools around the nature and meaning of these seven principles to begin to teach them outside of the DREs and the RE programs. We need to teach that as if it's a debate. What the hell does it mean, the inherent worth and dignity? Is, does Hitler, did Hitler or Stalin have inherent worth and dignity? And I apologize to Stalin for mentioning his name with Hitler, but I'll, I'll do that for purpose. <laughs> in other words, we must, it, it, it's, it's a lot of work and that's why we had to be in a single organization. So hopefully when we uh, leave this meeting, we all think about joining UMIAC and becoming more involved. And I, I got a little note here that said, this is our weapon, the Zoom. We're going to start Zooming each other. We're going to form a Zoom church or a Zoom. It used to be a thing called the Larger Fellowship. It, it, was that, is that still around? Yeah, it's there. Church of the Larger okay. Fellowship. So we'll be the church of the Shorter Fellowship. Uh, well, the thing that holds us in common is our desire to re radically reform the UUAC or be kicked out trying. Lenin said, whenever you want to create a revolutionary change, make the existing tyranny live up to its own ideals. Let it live up to its own ideals. Make them live up to their own ideals, and you see how quick a revolution will take place. So we're not in for a revolution at the present time, but we need to go back two steps, back to those principles, back to our history. We need a theology that humanists and Christians and pagans can all agree this is what it means in these strange seven statements that were hammered out over a period of time. God knows how long it took, but they have never been deconstructed, explicated, unpacked. Each one of those things. How can you have the right of conscience and yet vote in a democratic process? That's not a self-evident truth. That has to be worked out. That has to be expanded, opened up. And I've gotten to the point that if, the, our, if our seminaries won't do it, by God, we'll create our own seminary. But uh, that's another story. Uh, this might be getting too much in the weeds, but this, uh, this Poor People's Campaign, as Jonathan mentioned here, it is a good match for us. I also think that the larger UUA um, will, will themselves be involved in the Poor People's Campaign. And I think it would be an interesting uh, study to see uh, you know, their approach versus our approach and how they, they mix and meld and, and what kind of uh, what kind of tensions are coming together is that that, that, that opportunity brings. Uh, but I think it will be something that, that we will have to be aware of. Go ahead, Dick. Yeah, and Poor People's Campaign, um, I think it was 2018, I led an effort to get an action of immediate witness passed in support of the Poor People's Campaign. However, that did not pass, which was interesting. Uh, even though the uh, Susan Frederick Bray as president had endorsed the campaign and they have you know, supported it in, in some sense. But it's also, and also there was a, was it, it may have been 2018 or 2017, I can't remember which one, uh, Reverend William Barber was about invited to the G8 and put on a real, a real uh, revival kind of program. I was very enthusiastic. But on the other hand, there's also a huge gap between Barber, who's in the Martin Luther King tradition, much like us, and then the young Black Lives Matter people. And I have not heard very much from the UUA about the Poor People's Campaign more recently. And I, I suspect it's probably because of this big gap that's right there. But I think we can take advantage of, and if, if when we have a local poor, poor people's campaign, we could uh, say, well, here's a way we can be involved in a way with, in this case, uh, African American leadership that's not all in infected with these kinds of new critical race theory ideologies. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. I just want to say I agree very much with what Finley has just said and um, issue, I think, partly of trying to um, frame race the way that UA is, is, is really falling into kind of classic trap in which try to foment these problems around race and, 
and frame them the way that a lot of people do basically has the purpose of trying to make sure that poor white people, for example, and poor white and poor black people do not unite because that's what's really dangerous. May I make an observation? I'm worried that this is a whole bunch of elaborate virtue signaling. You have people who are arguing that we're very virtuous because we go around and we suppress other people. But on the other hand, what it has been suggested that these are, it's a very elaborate form of uh, people with money or power or would be have power are doing a great deal of virtue signaling. We're very virtuous, but then you examine what does this amount to? It amounts to badgering people uh, in your own congregation, but does it accomplish anything at all? You know, I, I remember being uh, working for an OBA, for OBA on the west side of Chicago and working against things like uh, redlining, uh, redlining and blockbusting and all the rest of this stuff. Uh, which was, and in some places still is, a, uh, a, um, a true structural racism. But the problem I'm having is that they're not pointing at anything that they want to take out in actual society. They're just saying, we want you to be as miserable as possible and confess it for the rest of your life, and what else are you going to do? And the answer is nothing. This is very peculiar, uh, and it's certainly not getting white people and black people together, which is, uh, I think, more important. Gabriella is our uh, black young, I use the word black rather than African-American, young black uh, okay. sister, biracial heritage, who I met as a little kid many years ago at First U, and who was driven out of our church because her, her family was, was treated in a racist manner by our minister. They just left because they were bored, they were not true. There was some disagreement on the religious side, but the reason was of the racial treatment that they got from uh, the, our minister. But she has remained con connected through Our Lives Matter and other positive things of our uh, great denomination. And so I have invited her to come on board. She was a part of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Well, I mean, I like Bernie Sanders. I wasn't part of his campaign. I was part of But you did go down with us to uh, Kokomo. We have talked about a lot about this racial issue. Would you like to chime in and share your thoughts as the youngest member of a bunch of these old folks that are on this uh, screen, except for Leah, who's, who's very young. Now that uh, Bernie Sanders has endorsed uh, Biden, what are you guys going to do? Um, most people are probably going to vote for Joe Biden. Um, but I do know a lot of people who also are not going to vote for Joe Biden. They're not going to vote at all. I'm personally not advocating for him. What do you see as a, a group like UMIAC? What role could we play with all these issues in the uh, coming election of 2020? Well, like right now, and like different groups that I'm focusing on, because like right now I'm kind of getting... Uh, away from like electoral politics and so right now what I'm getting is like just the opportunity to energize people because they you know see how like right now I think that like uh, one of my like focuses or goals or whatever is to try to like um connect up other people with like non-electoral resources, like labor organizing or like student organizing with like tuition payments and things like that. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I've been straying away from the whole like Biden situation. DePaul University, was that ever settled about the tuition and stuff like that? Um, yes and no. We, some things were, our tuition wasn't. So like, for those of you who don't know, so like I was involved with a group of like, well, I guess we'll call it like the leftist coalition at DePaul with a bunch of different leftist groups. So we have like students against mass incarceration, the socialists, um, like, uh, like students for justice in Palestine, like a bunch of different leftist groups. 
um, got together and made like a list of demands for the university um, upon like closing due to like coronavirus and stuff. Um, some of them we got, some not. One thing that's kind of ongoing is um, like moving forward into the fall semester for online, how things will go. And then also all of like, um, some of our workers were like fired, like our food service workers were fired. Um, and so there's been like different petitions and like solidarity um, movements, actions, like, but only online, like, because we can't get together in person right now. Um, so ongoing slash some progress, because we did get some of the things we wanted. The existence of church support, like a UU church support, be helpful in such a situation, do you think? Um, in general, yeah, when we have things like, depending on the issue, um, but like right now, like virtually, if we have things like online actions, because we kind of had one where we had a bunch of people calling in certain offices at once and emailing at the same time too. So like stuff like, or like just even signing petitions and stuff like that. Like, I don't know, like I sent um, our petition to a bunch of different groups, like people I know in like union organizing and like people I know from like politics back in Indiana and stuff. So, I mean, like, it's always nice to have like just the extra support of different groups, but right now we're going through some like internal structural changes. So we're not like doing that much this quarter until we figure that out. We have like leadership and things like that. And my last question is, uh, is this white supremacy allergy stuff uh, prevalent in your campus? about all white people are white supremacists, we live in a white supremacy culture, is that? Not like so, not like that, no. People don't say stuff like that necessarily, but um, I don't know, at least like my group of friends and stuff is pretty diverse and like, I don't know, I, I don't know, not really. Thank you for sharing and uh, the newest member of UMIAC, You'll be taking my place, by the way, at the uh, proper time uh, with training and, and experience. Back to Carl Wolf. Thank you, uh, uh, Gabriella. Is this, is this, do you make that decision, or is that a, is that a, a decision of the collective? That's a decision of the collective. Okay. Not that Gabriella would be a bad choice. What a process it has to be. Yeah. <laughs> hey, but the days of, 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 of the Fuhrer making appointments is over. <laughs> yes. I want each person to identify some positive things, some community things that have been going on at your churches, congregations. Give me some of the positives. So let's go around the whole room. Clark, not Kathleen, but, but Mr. Kathleen Clark. One thing that, that we do that is very interesting and I've not heard it being done at other UU churches, um, but is we have a, uh, a welcome essentials pantry that once a month provides an opportunity for people to show up. And it turns out we had uh, a couple of people, our poorer people in our congregation, noted that food stamps and WIC and these other sorts of social assistance programs, you can't buy shampoo or toilet paper or toothbrushes or that sort of thing with those benefits. You only buy food. So what we provide is not food. We provide toilet paper, paper towels, toothbrushes, toothpaste, um, hand soap, laundry soap, dish soap, a whole series of things. I mean, diapers, a whole series of things that you can't buy with those, uh, um, you know, the aid programs, I guess, that exist out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they had 67 bags made up this morning. We got an email. Um, they expect over 170 people, though, and it may be more because of, you know, the huge unemployment right now. And that happens tomorrow will be the, the date on that. Um, but it's, it's very successful, and it's something that many people are committed to. Some, you know, very committed. They, they not only buy things themselves, but they bag them, and then they staff the, the, uh, the day. Uh, it, it's very successful, though, and it, truly a heartwarming sort of piece of social action that, that we, we do here in DeKalb. 
we have a feeding ministry within the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, called The Banquet. Um, one of our congregants um, and her husband have taken it upon themselves to be responsible once or twice a week, twice a month for that feeding ministry. And many of us go and help on that. It's a thing where people come, um, some are poor, some are just looking for a, a meal where they can sit down and have a chat with somebody. And that's something where we, we get our face out on the, uh, on the street in a positive and uh, uh, supportive manner. What about you, Kenneth? Anything positive going up in your area? I already mentioned the participation in a citywide coalition of churches, more than half of which are African-American churches, that is dealing with racism issues, has research committees that are, some of our people are part of, and they are always integrated. The leadership is always integrated. Um, 22 members of our 150-member congregation have become uh, network members for this group, and last year, 70 attended the really big meeting where we're putting pressure on city officials and such. So this is a, an approach to anti-racism that has certain real benefits for the issues we are able to address. Um, beyond that, we are one of two Unitarian churches in a city of several well, millions. It's a large city, including its surroundings, that is very conservative. So we have been in a unique position of growing considerably um, and some turnover because there's, there's a good, some turnover because the people move in and out. There's enabled air stations, a lot of other things, but we also have a lot of small uh, kids. And a big thing is we do not have a minister. We have it's for 30 years now. There have been a couple of years, a couple of different times when there've been ministers for fairly short terms, but usually for one reason or another, it hasn't worked out. And uh, we do have a full-time director of religious education. That was the model from the beginning. Start with a full-time director of religious education. Um, anyway, um, good things are happening for the church overall. Um, there are several members of the church who are aware of Todd's book and are approving of it. However, our focus has been much more on things we are doing in the community, things that for our fellow members and stuff like that. It's been overall a, a positive group. First Unitarian Church, anything positive going on there? Our okay. criminal justice task force was just involved in a program, you mentioned it earlier, to get a young man released from Cook County Jail, a, man, a young man who was in there because of emotional issues, um, largely. And we've worked with his father and with some other groups and as of this week, he's out of jail. Unfortunately, the powers that, that be at the church when they talk about things rarely talk about the achievements of the criminal justice task force at our church. And just piggyback on that, uh, some of the other areas that we've worked with, uh, we've got a support group for uh, a returning citizen, and so we've been uh, Work came out the last October. He's 65 now, and so we've been working on housing issues, you know, riding him with uh, transportation until he finally got his card now for free transit, uh, a variety of other issues. So, uh, you know, so we meet with him and work, assist in various ways that he needs uh, support with. So that's one thing. And again, several of us have also been involved with. Uh, the Community Renewal Society, which is an interfaith group in Chicago, lobbying on a lot of things relating to uh, criminal justice reform. For example, we, there was an um, amendment to the Cook County Human Rights Ordinance to basically greatly reduce the uh, uh, prejudice or discrimination against people with records in, in the housing field. So we got that passed um, during 2019, and it's now in the rollout stage and so forth. So. Uh, so a number of us were involved with lobbying on that and otherwise uh, involved with that. So I think we've done some, some good work. I would like to speak on um, what has been done in relation to the COVID virus and connecting, keeping the um, congregation connected. Bobby initiated uh, uh, five different groups. So we're always be connected. And so what we do, uh, we, you know, sometimes we meet on Zoom, other time we just have conference calls to just 
you know, talk about what's going on in their lives. So I think that's been, been a very positive thing. Um, we do have um, the service on, you know, on Zoom or YouTube, but um, to be able to just keep connected, to, especially with, you know, some people who are living alone, um, I think that's been a real positive thing that, that uh, Bobby initiated for our first, for our congregation. Yeah, Marie, I'd like to uh, raise that up. That's something that we've been concentrating on at First Unitarian Hobart is getting that phone tree uh, in place and making it active so that we're all kind of checking in on one another. Um, and that's something that's been very positive over the last couple of weeks, particularly as uh, we had a, uh, an older uh, congregant pass away, um, not from coronavirus, but just, you know, it was his time. And so uh, having that in place is very important and something to definitely be, be happy about. One of the positive things I'm glad to mention that we're doing at Wildflower Church is some years ago, we started a program where we grant a thousand dollar scholarship to a Hispanic student who's the first one in his or her family to go to college. That's now grown to where we can offer four scholarships a year. And I've asked that we broaden it to include scholarships to African American students. And I hope that happens. So our congregation has become quite generous in that regard. And so I'm proud of us for that, despite the fact that we're beginning to shut down voices in other areas. We started up our Green Sanctuary team again and are trying to do some further analysis of how well we're living up to that as far as environmental on uh, reducing our carbon footprint. And we also have begun some other things that were curtailed by COVID-19, but members of our church have been calling everybody in the congregation to check on their well-being during the shutdown. Jonathan, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of the ministers in our church has, he's given sermons on like the need for dissent and freedom of conscience and stuff like that. So there's some hope. I see Ellen LaRue has her hand up. Let's give her the last word in this, in this particular plenary. Go ahead, Ellen. Okay, I, I agree with the, uh, the, what the three, Three previous first you people were saying, they, then I thought I didn't have anything to say, but I remember now that uh, we had scheduled uh, two first forums uh, one that I was really looking forward to. Uh, one was about the fifth principle, and one was a uh, a discussion of the Gadfly papers. And uh, they unfortunately, then I think it might be um, a plot but we got struck by uh, the c shutdown on account of the coronavirus and we can't do those. Uh, so that's a disappointment. Uh, but I thought it was really, you know, I thought, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna have this conversation, uh, maybe later. Let's get together and feel